Hey everyone, we're back and today we're talking about the differences between the direct and indirect methods of representing your cash flow statements. My name is Brandon and I'm the CEO of a company called Poindexter, which is a simple financial planning application targeted at entrepreneurs and small business owners so that they can do their own financial forecasting without the need for highly paid professionals. We've helped thousands of businesses put together their own forecasts and financial statements such as cash flow statements and income statements uh, for that purpose. So we do have some experience in this space. But today the goal of the video is to teach you the differences between the two different types of cash flow statements, uh, namely the direct and indirect methodologies for reporting cash flow. And at, if you stick around to the end, we'll discuss how to choose which one might be right for your situation. Before we do that, we will discuss exactly where the cash flow statement fits into the overall picture. Many of you may be familiar with the income statement, which tells us how much money we've made over some period of time. And then we have the balance sheet, which tells us how much money we have at some point in time or how much in some asset we have at some point in time. And then lastly, we have our cash flow statement, which tells us where all the money went during some period of time. So these are the three primary financial documents that most businesses have to deal with. And looking at these descriptions, it seems as if the income statement and cash flow statement are pretty similar and they almost might be redundant. So it raises the question, why do we need a cash flow statement? There are two primary reasons why the cash flow statement is required. The first is that the balance sheet itself is missing some crucial information just by virtue of the way it's constructed. It's typically referred to as a snapshot at a point in time, and it's hard to tell what's happening between two snapshots. So the transactions that take place between two snapshots are all lost if we're just looking at the balance sheet on its own. The second reason is that the income statement is hiding some key information, most likely, and we'll cover the situations that it's not hiding information, but in most situations, the income statement isn't giving you the whole story about what's happening with cash behind the scenes. If we take a look at a simple example of a balance sheet, we can see that between two reporting periods, namely in this example, today and yesterday, uh, that it's hard to tell what happened to our cash balance between those two periods. And it's like as if you looked at your bank account balance yesterday and you looked at it today and only see the balance and both days they're the same, but you know you spent money and you know you received some money. Uh, so the spending and the receiving of money is lost in translation here between the two periods. So we only see the ending balance, but we don't see the actual transactions that take place between them. That's really where the problem with the balance sheet lies because it only takes place at a certain point in time and between two points, we have no idea what took place. So the cash flow statement helps fill the gaps with those transactions that actually did take place to change any sort of balances in any of the accounts on our balance sheet. When we take a look at the income statement, we're dealing with a slightly different issue. And when, when we say it's hiding information, what we mean is that just because we see numbers reported for this month, let's say 120,000 in revenue, it doesn't necessarily mean that we collected 120,000 revenue from clients or customers. It just means that we earned it. And the reason we're allowed to do this is because of what is known as accrual accounting principles. And what they tell us is that we're able to recognize revenue in the period that we actually earn that revenue. It might take a few days, weeks, maybe, and hopefully not months for customers to actually pay us for that. Uh, but we get to recognize it in the month that we earn it. And that goes the same for costs and expenses so that we keep everything basically between the parameters of that single month so that we can keep things clean and we know what's earned and we can track who owes us and who we owe at the same time. And it introduces some new complexity into the income statement as a result. But uh, if we have a cash-based business, for instance, then we would only be reporting the cash that we paid out and the cash that we collected. And in which case, the income statement in that situation would be very close to what a cash flow statement is. But most businesses are not going to be that simple. Uh, even simple businesses aren't that simple. And so we'll go through uh, an example right now to demonstrate what I mean. Imagine a roadside taco stand that only accepts cash. No credit cards, no other forms of payment. You either have cash and can get tacos, and if you don't, you will not have any tacos. A customer walks up, they can pay cash, get tacos. In this situation, cash flow is revenue, or revenue is cash flow. There's really no difference because there was no lead time between the time that the customer paid for the tacos and they received the tacos. 
uh, they didn't pay up front and then receive them later, and then they didn't receive the tacos up front and then pay later. So there was no difference there between the time. Uh, for these types of businesses, a income statement is very similar to a cash flow statement uh, because assuming that they're paying their expenses and costs the same way all in cash um, because there is no accounting for the fact that we've earned something without having paid for it yet and vice versa. It doesn't take much for the situation to get more complicated. Imagine a simple salon that accepts a few different payment methods, such as credit cards or Apple Pay or even Bitcoin. Why not? We're in 2021. So in those situations, it's not as simple as giving someone cash and then uh, getting some goods or services because there's middlemen involved now, um, or technologies at least. And we might imagine a situation where a customer walks up, pays with a credit card, gets a haircut. But the thing here is that with a credit card, your cash is not necessarily going to be available right away. You might have to wait two, three, four days uh, from that transaction before the cash actually hits your bank account. In this situation, the revenue that you've collected or, or earned rather is not equivalent to the amount of money you've received. So if this happened on the last day of the month, you would recognize the revenue for that transaction during this month or that month, but your cash flow statement would have to correct for the fact that you haven't collected the cash yet for that transaction. And with this simple example, you can see how things can get complicated uh, pretty quickly. And the larger your business is and grows, uh, the more sophisticated and, and complicated transactions can tend to be. This is pretty much as simple as it gets, but this is the exact scenario that the cash flow statement is here to help us uh, navigate and understand. I thought it would be best to start off with a side-by-side -side comparison for both methods because ultimately these documents are more similar than they are dissimilar. Because the goal for both is exactly the same, it's to tell us what happened to cash flow over some period. So looking at both methods side by side here, we can see that the structure of these documents is exactly the same. So um, there's an operating activity section, there's an investing activity section, and there's a financing activity section. So not much difference there, that helps us kind of encapsulate uh, what the cash flow statement's all about, uh, even with different methods, just by looking at the structure. And we can even take that a step further and mention that the investing activities for both sex or both methods rather is exactly the same. There's no difference. And that goes the same for the financing activities. So when we're looking at the differences between direct and indirect method, we're really just talking about the differences in the operating activities and how they calculate cash flow from operations. With that in mind, we can start by looking at the indirect method. The trademark characteristic of the indirect method is that net income is on the top. And net income seems familiar, doesn't it? It seems like we should know about it from maybe another financial statement. Oh yeah, the income statement. So all we're doing is taking net income from the income statement and then putting it on the top of our cash flow statement. And in this way, we're kind of treating net income as representative of our cash flow from operations, at least as a starting point. And then what that means is we're then taking the rest of the line items here in operating activities and we're using them as adjustments for the things that we don't know. Because remember, income the net income represents everything that happened on the income statement. And we already know that the income statement may have some hidden information in there. In order to tease out that hidden information and get a clearer picture of what happened to cash flow, we are gonna make some adjustments to net income. So it's really based on the idea that, uh, the indirect method is based on the idea that net income uh, is cash flow-esque, and then all we need to do is make some adjustments to it to figure out what cash flow actually was. And it just so happens that most of the adjustments here uh, that take place, uh, so depreciation and amortization, for instance, that's a non-cash transaction. I didn't expect anybody to know that, but um, that's what it is, and then the rest of these are actually balance sheet items. So we have a decrease and increase in inventory. So a decrease in inventory would actually uh, be an increase to cash because we sold more inventory than we bought is what that's saying, right? So if we bought more inventory than we sold, then we actually used cash. But if we sold more than we bought, that means that we actually collected more cash for the inventory we had than we paid out in inventory purchases. And that goes the exact same for accounts receivable and accounts payable. These are 
kind of counterintuitive to understand, but the decrease is actually a positive number and the increase is in parentheses, as you can see there, which represents a decrease in cash. Because if we decrease accounts receivable, that means we collected more in receivables, collected more of our receivables than we generated in new receivables. So more people paid us than we gave credit to essentially. And that goes the same for uh, accounts payable as well. So uh, when we consider those accounts altogether and the adjustments that take place, we can add them to net income or subtract them from net income and then figure out what cash flow actually is. So we're just adding or subtracting the changes in balance sheet accounts mostly to understand what happened to cash for operations in the indirect method. When we take a look at the direct method, there's a slightly different approach for calculating operating cash flows. And if we look even more closely at the line items, they might even seem familiar, almost too familiar, like they come from another financial document that I can't put my finger on. Oh, the income statement, of course. So if we take a look at cash collected from customers, that seems similar to revenue, right? And materials might seem kind of similar to cash payments to suppliers for inventory. And surely salaries is the same as employee salaries. So you might be noticing a trend here where the line items for operating activities almost relate directly to the line items on your income statement. And so what that means is that we're taking the income statement and we're just converting it into its cash flow equivalent. We're correcting it, if you will, on a line by line basis, which is really helpful for the purposes of management and decision making, because if we are paying too much for insurance or uh, for some reason we had some unexpected expense with suppliers, uh, we would be able to identify that much easier than the indirect method where everything's lumped into net income. So this gives us a lot more actionable intel, which is helpful, right? Um, but does that make it better? As we just discussed, cash flow from operating activities in the direct scenario is more actionable, it's more detailed, it gives us a better sense of what's actually happening to cash as it flows through our business and operations. Why would we ever want to choose the indirect method where all we have is a net income at the top and then we have to make some adjustments to figure out what happened to cash? Wouldn't we always want to choose direct? This guy knows the answer, don't you? Well, unfortunately, life is very rarely that clear cut. I know, I know, it's sad when life isn't clear cut, but there's a few considerations to take into account before choosing which one is right for you. The first of which is time, because it takes a lot more time to put a cash flow statement together from the direct method than it does the indirect method. Think about it. In the indirect method, all we're doing is taking net income and slapping it onto a cash flow statement, making some adjustments, and calling it a day. With the direct method, we're taking almost each line on the income statement and converting it into its cash flow equivalent. That is no small task if you're a large company. As a result of the increased time, you're looking at increased costs as well. Lastly, complexity. It's not only more complex in the sense that you are doing more cash flow conversions with the direct method than you are the indirect method. But as your business scales, it's going to be nearly impossible to reconcile hundreds of thousands of accounts and understand uh, what cash has transacted between the various parties. It's almost the sole reason why most Fortune 500 companies use the indirect method. It's going to save you a lot of time, a lot of cost, and a lot of complexity. I hope you found this explanation helpful, and if you did, please like and subscribe for future content just like this. And if you're in the market for a simple financial forecasting tool that gets rid of the spreadsheet chaos, please check out getpointdexter.com. That is our product, and we made it for customers just like you. Thank you.